Good morning, and thank you so much for joining our services today. My name is Rebecca, and if you are new, we just want to extend a special welcome to you this morning. Um, you can check out our website, macombcc.org, for more information about us, or you can text the number on your screen, and you'll receive a visitor's card this morning that you can fill out, and we'll be able to contact you directly. Um, if you have any prayer requests, then you can also visit our website. There's a spot on there where you can submit them, because we would love to be praying for you. And if you would like to follow along on the YouVersion Bible app, there's a link in the description box of this video, or you can just search um, Macomb Christian Church under the events tab on the app itself. This morning, we're going to have a time of worship, a time of communion, and then Andy's going to bring the second sermon in his new series, What Would Jesus Say To? Let's stand up and sing together.
to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms. is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are
Good morning, Macomb. My name is Marty. This is my wife, Robin. Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying your Memorial Day weekend, uh, taking time to reflect and think about those who have sacrificed for our freedoms. Um, especially during this time, we think about the doctors and nurses, uh, first responders during the COVID situation we're in. Um, but I think it's also important to uh, think about what had Jesus had done for us um, and the sacrifices he had made. So during this time of communion, um, we're gonna get ready. If you have some uh, communion emblems you wanna get ready, uh, Robin's gonna leave a message and we'll open us in prayer. So I figured um, with this quarantine and just that this verse that I um, came across in um, Psalms would just be a good time just reflecting about it's usually in the times of suffering or longing for things that God works um, and gives us, and it's a beautiful time to just really reflect um, the gift that Jesus has given us. So, um, and this this is a good uh, verse for just just really the character of God's heart, His love for His children, and um, from beginning of creation to now, and just how much He has loved His children and the sacrifice He has made um, with His one and only Son. So I want to read um, Psalms 145, verses 14 through 16. It says, The Lord ups, upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every li living thing. And, and I love when I'm um, looking up the definitions, the uh, you know, Greek and Hebrew to scriptures. And um, I just love the last um, two verses, you know, food was like his fuel. Um, and then he opens, it's, he freely gives um, his hand, which is like his power and authority. And he satisfies, to satisfy is to fill and or to be full of our desires, um, which is our longings. And um, when you look up desires in the Greek, Hebrew, it means passion, and it just made me thought of the Passion for Christ. Um, for Easter, our family, we watched the Passion for Christ movie, and it just, what a visual that was to, of God's love for his children, that he um, gave his one and only son to sacrifice because he longed for us to know his love, to experience his love, to fill us with his love, and to live that full life that he, that abundant full life that he wants for his children. Um, so as I, um, before we, you know, take the cup and um, of his blood um, that, you know, shows uh, of him cleansing us from our sins and his body, um, the bread, his body, I just want to um, just lead us in a time of prayer right now and just thanking him for, for the gift that we have. So Lord, Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for all that you are, for, um, Father God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to just um, suffer in the anguish, in such anguish, and uh, on the cross to take up all our sins, all our longings, Lord, and just to give us, to gift us, and give us this beautiful gift of your love, your spirit within us. And we just ask, Lord, that you, um, this week and right now, we just reflect on the areas of our hearts that we long for, that we have filled of other things in this world that are not of you. And so we just ask for that forgiveness and um, we just turn our eyes back to you, Lord, and just ask you to fill those areas in our hearts, Lord, with your love, um, your, your desires for us. And um, we just, your longing for us. And I, we just thank you so much for allowing us to be your children and to, for your everlasting love. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, go ahead and get ready to take your emblems as you feel led. You guys have a blessed day. We're entering into our offering time now. And I just want to commend you all. You've been so good at giving. Um, for this hospital project over the last uh, four weeks as we've been collecting, uh, you've turned in an amazing amount of items just to help bless the hospital and help take care of the workers there. Um, the list goes something like this. It's been 40 cleaning items, separate cleaning items that have been given, 60 lunches, 2,200 drinks, and 
3,800 different healthy snacks. You know, I love the way as a church that you just respond to the needs as you give. And as we come to this offering time right now, there's just so much we have still to commend you as a church about the way that you continue to give. Um, please, um, in a moment, we're going to pray for what you've already given because you've been so faithful in giving online and giving in the mail and just dropping checks off here by the church. Or even today, like you could text to give at 586-501-8816. Just text GIVE to 586 586- 5018816 and you could give because God takes these things that we give and he does amazing ministry through the money that we give and the items that we donate and so thank you for what you've done. Let's take a moment and let's praise him for what he's going to do through the way that you've responded to him. Father, as we give as an act of worship, we're just so grateful that you take the things that we give and Father, you do amazing things with them. And so we want to pray that you would take the offerings that have been collected over this last week as they come in. Uh, Father, the gifts that we've been able to give uh, for our community and the workers in our community. And Father, we're praying that you do amazing ministry through these gifts. Father, your kingdom needs to be known. Your son needs to be seen. Your love needs to be declared and made known. And Father, these gifts are just ways that we can do that together. So Father, bless these gifts at this time. And Father, multiply them into ministry in our community. And we pray this now in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Now, before we get to our message this morning, I just want to share with you just a couple of announcements, some things that are coming up here at our church. Um, Next Sunday, May 31st, we have our new Life in Christ class. Uh, You can sign up for that online. This class specifically uh, covers the topic of salvation and baptism. In other words, what does it mean to be saved? And what does the Bible teach about baptism? We realize that a lot of different church backgrounds teach a lot of different things about these, but this is a, a study and a look at what the scripture has to say about these topics. The class is at 9 30 it's a zoom class and so we do need you to sign up so we can send you an invitation to join us but that's at 9 30 next sunday may 31st uh, we've been also uh, around the church just participating in some work days together um, over the last a couple of weeks, eight, ten days now, um, there's just been some amazing progress been made, kind of sprucing this place up, uh, kind of our spring cleaning. Uh, mulch has been going down, things have been weeded, the gardens and our flower gardens are looking just amazing. And I, and I say that, and I'm a little sad because most of you have not been by the church to see any of this, but it really does look amazing. But we have two work days to go yet this coming week. Um, on Thursday, I'm sorry, Wednesday and Thursday of this week, we're going to finish up the spring cleaning and... Um, on our grounds so you can come work with us. We'll all work at least six feet apart, a little social distancing, and we'll do some good uh, for our church as we kind of spruce it up here. Uh, One last thing I want to share with you, and then we'll get to our message this morning. But in a letter a few weeks ago, um, our leadership had communicated uh, about the church parking lot, how that the the project was still being pursued, but because of the current financial state of of our nation and some of the uncertainty, that we didn't feel confident at this time taking out a loan to finish that project. And that's still true. But we are still collecting donations for the project. Uh, We need $100,000 to finish this parking lot project, and so far we've collected over $56,000 toward that, which leaves us with roughly about $44,000 to go. Now, the parking lot's been temporarily repaired, but the replacement for that top layer of the parking lot is still needed. We have had a donor uh, come forward here at the church and pledge a $10,000 matching gift to get us moving toward the parking lot now in 2020. That means for every dollar that's designated and given over the next three to four weeks um, until June 15th, it will be matched dollar for dollar up to $10,000. Now we realize that many of us in these uncertain times aren't really sure what's going on with some of the finances, but we know this. We have a God who is certain. And God does some of his most amazing work in some of the most uncertain times. And so we're trusting that God is going to still provide through you to continue to complete this project. So if you could contribute at this time, we'd really appreciate if you'd help us get toward that $10,000 match. You can do that online if you give by designating toward the parking lot. Uh, you can do that in, in, if you drop off your offering here at the church if just on the outside of the envelope you write parking lot or even if you mail it in on the outside of the envelope if you write parking lot we'll make sure it gets uh, to that fund so hey thanks uh, for being with us today we're going to continue in our series what would jesus say to and so just settle back and let's get ready to hear god's word today 
Well, good morning. I want to wish you all a happy Memorial Day weekend. Uh, thanks for being here with us and, and enjoying this service together. Uh, today, we just want to take a moment and just offer special honor to those who have served our country faithfully. Uh, there are men and women who have given their lives so that we can be a part of this country and maintain some of the freedoms that we get to be a part of. Uh, let me encourage you over the next couple of days, if there's someone that you know in your family or in your friendship circles who has lost a loved one because they've given their lives sacrificially, just take a moment over the next couple of days and just, just reach out to them. Just let them know that they're in your thoughts and, and in your prayers and, and just that you care to honor their loved one who's passed before us. So uh, let's take a moment today, though, and just open in prayer. Father God, we thank you for the privilege we have to serve you, and we thank you for the privilege we have to live in a country where we have freedoms. And God, there are men and women who have sacrificed their lives for us to have those. And, and Father, they follow the example that you have set, giving up your life for us. So today, Father, we just honor them and, and thank you for them. And just pray for their families that you will give them strength and comfort. And Father, as we uh, continue in this service today, we ask that you will just guide and direct us as we, as we hear your word and listen to your scriptures. Uh, help us to put these things into practice in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Today we continue in a series that Andy started last week, and uh, the question that the series is based upon is, what would Jesus say to? And then you fill in the, the, the blank with a name of, of a person or a people group. And today we're going to look at the question, you know, what would Jesus say or what did Jesus say to a politician? Uh, and that'll be an interesting topic. So um, now, I don't know about you, but over the last few weeks, I've spent a fair amount of time on social media, a lot more than I normally care to. And there's a lot that people have to say to politicians right now. Uh, some people just identify a politician and they just brag on them. They hold them up as the greatest thing in the world and they could never do any wrong. And they're so amazing, almost like a deity. Like, well, if they say it, it must be true. And they're so wise and so perfect. And, and some people on social media are just holding up these, these politicians as if they're the most amazing thing in the world. And then we see the other extreme, where people are looking at politicians and assuming the absolute worst. And, and the words being printed and the words being shared are just full of gossip and slander and anger and hatred. And they're basically just destroying the reputation verbally uh, of these politicians. Uh, and, and some of it might be true and, and some of it's clearly not true. And both of those extremes seem to be the dominant theme of what I could see on social media. And uh, it's very concerning. And today, as, as I read through those things, it really makes me kind of question, is this the kind of message that God's people ought to be sending to the world? Is this really the message that we ought to be putting out there about our politicians? And um, I think to help us really walk through that, taking a look at Jesus and how he handled politicians can really provide some great direction for us. So today, uh, he, he was introduced to a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a political leader. He was also a religious leader. And in the times that he lived and Jesus did his ministry, that was the, the environment. It wasn't a democratic society like it is today. Um, instead, the religious leaders were also the political leaders. So there was a guy named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, he says, hey, teacher, I've looked at the things that you've done. We've heard of all the things that you've done, the miracles and the wonders and the works that you've done. And clearly, they're from God. These are not from men, but these are from God. And that was an amazing compliment. You know, he, he literally just comes to Jesus and says, we're really impressed with what you're doing and what you're doing is amazing. And we know that it's from God. And that's just a great compliment. And then Jesus decides how he's going to respond. And in John chapter 3, that's where we're going to spend some time today, Jesus responds to Nicodemus. Now, in the context where Jesus is, he could have responded with all sorts of things. You know, he could have said, hey, there's this political issue, and um, since you're respecting me at the moment, let me share with you my concern, and maybe I can get you to vote a certain way. Uh, maybe I can influence your decision. You know, there's a religious topic over here that you guys aren't quite getting right, and maybe I can help clarify that and get it straight for you. And, and those are things that Jesus could have done. He could have addressed some of the agendas of the day, some of the hot topics of the day, but instead, he ignored all of that. He didn't bring any of them up. Instead, this is what Jesus says. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Well, that had nothing to do with the compliment that Jesus received. To our knowledge, it wasn't a part of the political environment of the day. 
Instead, what we see is Jesus taking the moment to say, here's a man who's coming to me. He respects me as a teacher. He recognizes that the things I'm doing and saying are from God. I'm going to share with him the most important thing I can possibly share with him. And Jesus proceeds to share with him some of the good news about the kingdom of God. That's his response. Jesus says, I t- very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. So when Jesus had an opportunity to talk to a politician, his response was, I'm going to share with you the most important thing in all of eternity, which is that you have an opportunity to be born again. You have an opportunity to live for the sake of the kingdom of God. And these things are what mattered most to Jesus. When we look at the teachings of Jesus and the life and the ministry of Jesus, this is the theme of his ministry. He continually is telling parables and stories about the kingdom of God. He's constantly comparing things to the kingdom of God. He's talking about who can enter it and how you can see it and when it will be shown and when it will be breaking forth. These are the things that Jesus taught about more than anything else. They were the core content that he preached about. So when he had opportunity to speak to a politician, Jesus turned to him and basically said, let me share with you the most important thing I can possibly share with you that you will benefit from. It's a message that you need to hear that can change your life. Now, if you had an opportunity to share a message, what would it be? You know, when you have an opportunity to post on social media, what kind of message do you send? Do you put out there a message about a politician? Do you put out there something that's just funny and you think people will laugh at? And, and, and we do, so thank you for that. I appreciate those. Uh, do you put stuff out there that's just encouraging and positive and uplifting? And, and those are all good things. But then some of you are putting stuff out there that, that really is unhealthy. It, it's critical, it's negative, it's demeaning. Um, some people will even put stuff out there about their marriage and their family and their life and just, and, and it's a lie, right? There's kind of this fabrication of the most amazing family in the world and the rest of us read it and go, wow, my family is awful compared to you. But in the reality, that's not your story either. It's just a fabrication. And then there are others who spend a lot of time on social media just putting images of themselves out there hoping to be, receive a compliment and receive affirmation as if their beauty and their physical looks and attractiveness is going to last for eternity, and it, and it doesn't. These things fade. They're temporary. I wonder what social media would look like if all of God's people said, I'm going to use these tools to share the most important message the world could ever hear. What if our focus was the message of the kingdom of God? What if our message was about the amazing creator that we serve and what he is like? What kind of a difference would that make in social media? So I I, I love the response that uh, Nicodemus then turns and gives to Jesus. He says, John 3, 4, How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. I just love this response. So here's this politician, and he's just like, dude, I'm tracking with you. I hear you, but this doesn't make any sense. Uh, You know, (laughs) hypothetically, I watched my kid be born from my wife, and, and there's no way I can do that when I'm old. That's crazy. What are you talking about? Right? And it's a confusing message for him. But I want you to pay attention to what Jesus did. What Jesus did in the conversation was Jesus directed the conversation once again to the things that mattered most. And then he follows up in verse 5 and says this, Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we, t- we, speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still 
you people did not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. And Jesus was speaking of himself there. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So basically, Jesus answers his question with, everyone who wants to receive eternal life must be born again. And they must be born of water and of spirit. Now, let me talk about that a little bit. I don't want to spend a a ton of time um, on the debate that's behind that, but I at least want to bring it to the surface. Most religious leaders, most teachers, most scholars agree that being born of the Spirit means that God, when we accept Jesus and we decide to follow him, that God pours out his Holy Spirit on us. That when we claim the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. And the Holy Spirit does amazing things for us. He guides us. He teaches us. He comforts us. He he gives wisdom. He gives gifts and abilities and talents beyond what's natural. He gives us words to say when we don't know what to say. The Holy Spirit is an amazing teacher. And to have the Holy Spirit dwelling within the people of God, leading and teaching and guiding them, is what it means to be born of the Spirit. It's that we're, we're no longer just going through life our own way, but instead we're going through life being guided and directed and instructed by the Holy Spirit. And this is an amazing gift. And when Jesus talks about this, he's like, you're going to be born of the Spirit. And that's just an incredible, incredible word of encouragement for all of us. Now, what's, what's a little more complicated is what does Jesus mean when he says born of water? And there are many um, godly teachers and leaders and theologians who see this different ways. And, and again, I'm not going to even try and tell you which one's right and wrong. I'll let you discern through that. But um, some basically say this, being born of water is referring to their original birth. When they were born by their mother, they were held inside the amniotic fluid, and when they were given birth, the fluid came out, and it's, it's primarily water, right? So, um, born of water is kind of what it's in reference to. So, the people who teach that way would say, yep, you were born of water the first time around, and then being born again is when you're filled with the Holy Spirit given by God. The, the other approach that, that many uh, leaders take is this. They say being born of the water is actually referring to baptism. It's the idea that when you're baptized, you're submerged, you're dunked under the water, and you come back up. So you're born of water, and you receive the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, a primary passage of Scripture that would be used is uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Uh, this is a, a pretty common passage, but... Um, Peter was teaching, and the people wanted to repent. They were like, what do we do? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, in Peter's passage there, it would be very easy to assume, oh, that means you're baptized, you're dunked under, and you come up, you're born of water, and you're given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then you go out from that day forward being filled with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, being instructed by the Spirit. And that kind of directs how you begin to live out your faith and put the ways of God into practice. So this, these physical responses, again, I'm, I'm not even going to try and guess at which one's right. Um, I'm, I'm just not that smart. And I don't know that it matters. You know, what we know is this. Any one of us who were born by our mothers, we were born of water. Anyone who entered the waters of baptism were immersed, you were born of water. So both are true. And I don't know that we need to discern through exactly which one Jesus was in reference to. What's important, though, is that these things are foundational to being born again. They're foundational. And the question is, what do we do with them? What does it mean for us to be born again? What does it mean for us to live a new life? As as we look at the study of Scripture and the the different teachings, I think what we see is this. In the life and ministry of Jesus, when he talked about the kingdom of God, he is giving us instructions on how to live. When we look at things like the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, we're getting instructions of how to live as people who live under the principles of the kingdom of God. And they're great instructions for us. They give incredibly practical ways to live and behave. So if you're stealing, steal no more. If you have financial concerns, 
don't worry. God will take care of you, right? These are some of the instructions given. If you're married, don't get divorced. That's, that's part of the instruction. There's all kinds of godly counsel within them. But being born again means I'm living for something different. What I know about all of us is this. We were born into a family or a, a setting of a family in some, some way, shape, or form. And all of us were formed. We began to think and live based upon our experiences. You know, for me personally, I was born to John and Linda Nugent, right? My mom and dad, they, they got together and, and had children. Um, the family I was born into, I have an older sister, Michelle. So Michelle was there before I was. So when I was born, I joined a family of three. A little bit later in life, I have a brother, John, and a brother, Brian. And the six of us became a family. That created the environment where I was taught, where, where I learned how to fight, where I learned how to love, uh, where I learned how to eat, where I learned how to walk, where you know, I learned how to play, where I learned how to go to school. My whole upbringing was foundational based upon that family. Now, my family attended church, so there was a church community that influenced me. Um, I went to preschool and then uh, kindergarten and elementary school. All of those things shaped and formed me. And I had experiences in all of those contexts. Well, those contexts really created the person that I became, right? Those experiences and my responses to those experiences created a life and a person that is known as Mike. Well, later in life, I had an opportunity to give my life to Christ and to say, Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life, and I want to be obedient to you in baptism, and I want to be filled with your Holy Spirit, and I want to live for you. And when I made that decision, basically what I was saying is, I want a new life. I don't, re I don't resent my parents. I don't resent my upbringing. But I want to live for something different. Because the values I was taught, that I taught myself based upon my experiences, were based upon my view of the world. And when we surrender our lives to Christ, basically what we're saying is, I'm no longer going to live life my way for my purposes but I'm going to live my life God's way for his purposes. And when his values conflict with mine, I'm going to choose his. When his truth combats my experience, I'm going to change my mind and agree with him. When the Holy Scriptures tell me one thing and society tells me something different, I'm going to follow the Holy Scriptures because they're teaching me the ways of God. And this is what it means to live a new life. It's to live life for a different purpose. To be born again is to be born into something brand new. We're starting over. You know, when someone gives their life to Christ, one of the beautiful things is they get a redo. They get to start all over. Now, I'd love to tell you that that means everything is perfect and, and glorious and nothing ever goes wrong, and we all know that's not the case. Instead, we go through life and we face the same hardships and the same struggles and the same challenges but we operate by different values and different priorities and different practices. We begin to let our lives be shaped from the way that we would naturally live to the way that Christ has designed for us to live. Now, some of you hearing me today, you're listening to that and you're saying, yeah, 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 I get the message, but you know what, Mike? I don't believe it. And when I talk to people who don't believe in Jesus and who don't follow Jesus, there's quite a few different reasons that people give. But there's one reason that seems to dominate most of the responses of why people don't believe in God. And most people will say this, I don't believe in God because of people in the church. There's people I've met who were claimed to be Christians, and yet they live like this. And their response is, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. So since you're hypocrites... I can't believe in God. Now, when I listen to that, my heart breaks. And it breaks for a couple of reasons. The first reason is because they're absolutely right. The church is full of hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. Our church leaders are hypocrites. People who sit in our chairs are hypocrites. Because all of us are people who have been raised with this set of values and we're trying to leave, live by this set of values. And we're torn between the two constantly. 
So there are times that we say something and we teach and we talk about the ways of God, and yet our behaviors are still over here. So we say one thing and we do another. We're hypocrites. And the standard that's being used is if people who allegedly follow God are getting it wrong, why should I bother? Well, I think the second thing that concerns me is I think that standard is really unhealthy. If God is the creator of the universe, I'm not going to follow him or believe in him because somebody I know is messed up. They're not synonymous things. When Jesus spent his life and his ministry on earth, he did it perfectly. He wasn't a hypocrite. When he said something, he did it. When he taught something, he lived it. He took every single thing he did and said and he put it into practice. He is not a hypocrite. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the New Testament is not a hypocrite. He's very consistent about the things that he says. And he's very consistent to do what he says he will do. Please don't confuse God with people. Don't blame God for the fact that I'm a hypocrite. That's not God's fault. That's my fault. Now, many of you are sitting in in your homes today and, and you're with your family. I want you to look at the people around you. If you're with some friends, just, just take a look at the people around you. And I want you to just simply tell them, say, you're a hypocrite. All right, now they're looking back at you. Guess what they're saying about you? You're a hypocrite. All of us are. So the standard of hypocrisy is true, but it doesn't mean that we should deny God because of it. And I think for the people of God, that really presents us with a challenge. Because we know that our very actions go against the things that God is teaching us to do. And I wonder if the world wouldn't be better off if we were honest about ourselves. If the times when we failed, instead of putting on a fake face, pretending we're perfect, if we were honest and just said, I really messed that up. God's teaching me this way, God says this, and yet I did this. I'm a mess. And here's the good news. Part of the good news of the kingdom of God is that God offers grace. God offers forgiveness. God looks upon the things that we do wrong, even though we want to do what's right, and he's willing to wipe them away and do away with them. The reason he sent Jesus to earth, one of the reasons he sent Jesus to earth was to live a perfect life and to die on the cross as a sacrifice because of the fact that you and I will do wrong. The good news for the world is this. You don't have to be perfect to follow Jesus. There would be no followers of Jesus if that was the prerequisite. The good news is, even though you mess up, even though you're a hypocrite, God's love and his grace and his forgiveness are bigger than that. And that is great news for all of us. I want you to listen to how Jesus kind of follows up on this and, or how the writer of, of John follows up on this after Jesus teaches. He says, uh, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You see, the good news in this whole thing is that there is a God who loves us. And he loved us enough to send his son Jesus in our place. And when you look at your own life and you go, I'm not good enough for God, you're absolutely right. And God's response is, I know you're not good enough, but I'm sending my son Jesus. And he's going to take your place He's good enough. And he's going to cover your sins and you will be pure and perfect and holy in my sight. And that is great news for us. And that news, that promise is available 
for everyone who turns to God and say, God, I believe in you. I want to put my faith in you. I want to live my life for you. I want to seek first the kingdom of God instead of the kingdoms of this world. I want the abundant life, the eternal life, the born-again life that your scriptures talk about. I long for that. And the Word of God promises us that we can have that. You know, I think one of the challenges we face is we get distracted because of the things that we see. We get distracted because of the lives of people around us. And I want to encourage you, take your mind off of those things and focus on what matters most. When Jesus met a politician, Jesus didn't look at the bad decisions that were being made. Jesus didn't look at the political system and all that was wrong with it. Jesus looked at the man and said, you were created by God. You were made by God. And you have an opportunity to be born again. And you have an opportunity to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you have the opportunity to be baptized into Him. And you have the opportunity to live your life for Him. And you have the opportunity to have a life of purpose and mission and value that are all established by God. And that's what's ahead of you if you want that. Now some of you today, you might be ready to learn more about that. I want to share a couple of opportunities we have for you. Today, we have some elders in our church who are ready to talk with you. So if you have questions of, you know, what does being born again really mean? And Mike explained some, but I still have questions. They would love to talk with you and answer some of your questions. If you're someone who wants to like repent of an old way of life and start to live a new way of life for Christ, they're available to talk with you. Up on the screen, we're going to share with you a, an email address. It says the elders at macombcc.org. Go ahead and send them an email. Just make it real short. Just say, I would really love to talk with someone about this topic right here. Can you call me and put down your phone number or put a question in email and say, would you mind responding to me through email? They would love to respond to you. They would love to have a conversation with you. And they'll get back to you today. If you listen to this message three months from now, email the elders at MacombCC.org will respond to you because helping people know what it is to have an abundant life and a, and a born-again life in Jesus Christ, we'd love to help you do that. The second opportunity we have for you is next Sunday, we offer a class called A New Life in Christ. It starts at 9.30 in the morning. It's a Zoom call. It'll go till about 10.30. If you go to our church website, MacombCC.org, and click on the link, you'll be able to sign up for that class, and we'll send you a link for the Zoom call. But in that class, we're going to do a few simple things. We're going to share with you, here's what the Bible says about baptism. We're going to share with you, here's what the Bible says about salvation. And then here's how Macomb teaches it and why we teach it the way we do. And you'll have an opportunity to ask questions in that class. And, and the, the great thing about that class is this. It's almost, about 80% of it is just sharing with you scripture. We just want to share with you what the scriptures say about these topics so that you can make an educated decision of what it means to follow Jesus. You know, when Jesus ran into Nicodemus, Jesus had an opportunity to have influence. And he could share with Nicodemus anything he wanted. And what did Jesus share? Jesus said, I want to share with you about the kingdom of God. And you need to be born again. Because there's nothing greater in the world that he could have shared with that man. So whether you're a politician, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, whether you're an executive or an engineer, the same message is true for you. Jesus is saying to you and Jesus is saying to me, I want you to be born again and I want you to experience the eternal life that's offered through Jesus. Will you bow with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for your holy scriptures. We thank you for teachings in the book of John that reveal a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And God, Jesus had the wisdom to see the greatest need that this man really had. It wasn't political advice. It wasn't wise counsel. It wasn't direction on a virus or a stay-at-home orders. Instead, it was the abundant life offered through Jesus. And he made that known. And God, what a beautiful blessing we have that we can read these scriptures and learn of this experience. So Father, today for each one listening to this message, I pray that our hearts and our minds will be open to you. 
Help us to see past the hypocrisy of people and to see the perfect holy goodness of you. And help us to follow you with all of our heart. It's the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for this message and for the service. And we invite you to come back and we'll see you next week.